and that's the last memory I have. There was no time to get down to theatre. I'm a strong fighter. <laughs> Heart surgery paralysed me age nine. Yes, this is a true story. This is all about my spinal cord injury and why I use a wheelchair. Let's start from the very beginning. So when I was born, I was born on the 20th of November and everything was okay. I was born breech and my dear mummy had a very traumatic birth. She did it naturally, so please give thumbs up to Mama Wheels. <laughs> I was born and everything seemed to be okay. I had a bit of a dropped foot, which I talk about in my uh, limb difference awareness video and my wheelchair body confidence video, so go and check those out. When my parents brought me home, I think I was a little pale. I didn't feed very well and I was a bit underweight and I cried a lot, so I was quite a difficult baby, but no one knew like, what was going on. You know, I kind of grew up as a toddler. Everything seemed to be okay, I don't think. My parents noticed anything different with me. Um, then I started school and uh, at like five, four or five. And at that time, um, children when they started school had to be visited by like um, a nurse or a doctor and you'd go into the medical room, they'd check your eyes, your hearing, I think like your weight, your height, your heart and everything like that. And everyone had to do that. I think it was like a government thing. So I had my heart checked, obviously, and that is when they discovered that there was something wrong with my heart. If it wasn't for the screening at my school, then my heart problem would never have been picked up, uh, which is why it's quite important to have these medical screenings, which they don't have any longer in schools. Then I had to go to my doctor, and then I was transferred to um, the Brompton Heart and Lung Hospital up in London and that's where I underwent like all of my tests and they would do ultrasounds on me like they would do it in my neck to look down at my aorta I remember that because it, it used to kind of choke me and like make me gag and they'd do it for blimmin hours they'd have this blimmin ultrasound probe in my neck and that really used to give me the <laughs> and there and like under here and all that jazz um, and it, they would, they would do ultrasounds for what seemed like ages, ages and ages. Anyway, they discovered and told my parents that I had a coarctation of the aorta. If you don't know what that is, um, the aorta is the main artery that pumps the blood to your body. Um, and the coarctation was a narrowing. Now the narrowing in my aorta was so thin, it was like tissue paper. And they said, as she grows, it's inevitable that it will burst. So we need to cut it out and stick it to bit together again. Simply said. Um, so when I was six, I went up to the Royal Brompton Heart and Lung Hospital and I had exploratory keyhole surgery. Now, for some reason, they went in my groin and they went on the um, right side of my groin and they went up and must have stuck a camera up into my heart to figure out what was going on and I guess to figure out what kind of surgery was going to take place. So I had that. I'm not going to lie, I actually quite enjoyed it. I think I had some time off school, it was an adventure going up to London, I was in the hospital, probably made a few friends, always been quite outgoing and inquisitive and got all this attention and new books and things to do in the hospital and all that kind of stuff. So that was really exciting and I enjoyed it. I don't think I've ever told anyone that, but I did. Came back, had this massive bruise in my groin where they had done the surgery. It was as big as my hand. I remember that because I was like measuring the bruise with my hand and it kind of looked like a map of Europe. Um, with all of the different colours and everything like that. Then, I guess, the surgeons decided what they were going to do and um, I had surgery, the major surgery, when I was nine. I remember riding my bike um, home from my best friend Laura's house, I think, and that's the last memory I have. I'm getting upset. Um, that's it. That's all I can remember. The next memory I have, I mean it's all blurred, but I think I can remember intensive care and waking up. So anyway, the day of my surgery came and 
we must have gone up to um, London, I think maybe the night before, and that was that. And then I had the surgery, and what they did was they cut me open, um, they cut me open um, here. And um, I did have pictures of them, but I think Instagram didn't like them very much, I'm not sure. Uh, but yeah, I've got a massive scar here. They came in through here and through the ribs and um, they cut out the narrowing and stuck it together again and that was that. And then um, they brought me round from the anaesthetic and um, this is all extremely painful. So what I know is what I know. Uh, my parents know the finer details, my mum's written a diary. I've tried to go there when a newspaper contacted me and wanted a story and tried to sit down with my mum but getting any new information like the smallest thing like even if my mum said I went to a shop and bought this on that day and I remember this like it seriously sets me back like even now it's really hard so what I know is what I know that's what I can cope with and that's all I want to know and I've done that I've come this far early in the morning um, they brought me round from the anesthetic and I choked on the intubated breathing tube that was in my throat and as I choked I panicked and obviously my blood pressure my heart rate raised and the stitches burst so I had an aortic rupture the um, mortality rate for that is about 90% um, so I was really lucky that one, it happened first thing in the morning and two, um, I remember seeing my surgeon a few years ago and um, he's like, oh yeah, I remember you <laughs> from all those years ago and we grabbed Dr Lincoln out of his car and ran him up to intensive care so it was just by chance that the surgeon was there. The surgery had to take place there and then, there was no time to get down to theatre. So they had to close off intensive care and do the surgery there. And um, I, I was without oxygen for, I, I heard it was like nine minutes, which is a really long time to be without oxygen. And I don't think many people come back from that, but they did, start my heart, my heart stopped, they started my heart and they stitched me up and I was on life support and I was put into an induced coma and my body temperature was dropped. Um, this was to try and get my body to um, recover basically. Um, at that time they didn't know what kind of state I was in um, and I think my parents were kind of told to prepare for the worst. And um, then um, I think like over over the days, like I underwent a lot of tests, like the tests to check that if you've got brain activity. And every day I'd like give my mum a sign and, um, that I was alive and that I was in there, and and I um through because I'm a strong fighter <laughs> and my grandma who's no longer with us she was devastated obviously and she was like she's a fighter she can get through this I know her I know she can I know she can get through and I did I don't remember waking up. <laughs> um, like, but what I do remember, like slowly coming round, I couldn't see, like everything was really blurry. That was probably because I hadn't used my eyes for so long and like all of the drugs and um, probably the drugs, <laughs> I was really drugged up. I couldn't see, I couldn't move my arms, I couldn't move my legs. I think I could talk. <laughs> no one got in the way of me talking. Um, and I kept on saying, I've got bogeys in my nose. I've got bogeys in my nose. Can someone get the bogeys out? I just wanted to pick the bogeys out. And it wasn't till later on that I realized 
um, or was told that it was the breathing thingamabob that goes in your nose. Um, but yeah, I remember that. And then I was transferred to the ward. I kept wetting myself and pooping myself. And um, I, I felt awful. <laughs> I was drugged up, but I was awful and I couldn't move. And I remember thinking, I'm sure this wasn't supposed to happen. This wasn't supposed to be this bad. I'm sure they would have told me. Um, but um, my parents decided not to tell me what had happened right away which was probably um, the right decision and um, I don't think anything of it really that that's what happened and um, I remember trying to stand and my right my right side was affected more greatly than my um, left side and um, I remember trying to stand on my right foot and it felt like there was a tennis ball under there and I just couldn't stand and I couldn't walk and didn't understand and I remember there was this little girl in the hospital and um, she'd had surgery and whatever and then um, like a few days later she was up and walking about and I remember her mum turning to me, I was sat in my wheelchair and the, her mum turned to me and said, oh look Jim, she's walking, isn't that fantastic? And I was like, yeah, <laughs> why aren't I? So eventually I uh, was allowed to go home. Um, my mum sort of begged and pleaded to get me home as, as soon as I possibly can and my mum cared for me um, and I had physio every day um, and at this time no one knew that I had a spinal cord injury um, I believe that they thought that I had brain damage that's why I had the mobility issues coming home was really traumatic I didn't use a wheelchair at all, I crawled around, I wouldn't have anything to do with it. Um, I shuffled up the stairs and bum shuffled everywhere. And I still do. <laughs> and um, I couldn't sleep and I heard voices in my head and I don't know if anyone knows this either. Um, but uh, I would hear voices in my head at night and when you hear voices in your head, it's not like your thinking voice. You can actually hear people like in different corners of the room. And I would hear these people like all different kinds of voices saying, you will get better. You will walk again and all of this kind of stuff. And I was like, yes, yes. And I knew they weren't real. And when they would come, I thought, right, I'm not going to nod. I'm not going to nod because I know they're not real. But they would talk to me and I'd be like, yes, yes. Like they were real. They were really real to me. It was strange drugs I think <laughs> and I would cry myself to sleep and it was horrible. I had a little commode next to my bed I had to try and get on and off in the night and I would listen to stories um, at night because I couldn't sleep so I was traumatised and drugged up and um, they really helped. And then for the next few years, I had test after test after x-ray after MRI. And um, I went to Great Ormond Street. Had a lot of tests up there. Went back to the heart place to check I was all right. Um, and then, I don't know how and I don't know why, they must have picked up something that it could possibly be a spinal cord injury. So then I was sent down to Salisbury District, District Hospital where there's a spinal cord injury unit. Um, and I went there and that is where Dr. Tromans, his name was, sweet man, um, diagnosed me with a T10, incomplete spinal cord injury. This is due to the lack of oxygen to the spinal cord during the surgery. So that is how it came about and how I suffered my injury, something I meant to add. <laughs> so it wasn't until like nine years ago I saw a doctor before I had Daisy who assessed me and looking at my coarctation, he loosely diagnosed me with the, car with the vascular EDS and that's all I know. I know that I get chronic pain and I'm super bendy and I pull muscles really easily and I get very fatigued and my muscles get very fatigued very easily. Um, but with regards to like any ongoing care with that, I don't have any of that. 
that's my story and how I suffered my spinal cord injury. In my next video I'm going to talk to you about like how I was told, how I took it and how I accepted it because I think that might that be useful to you and if you're struggling today and that video is not out then I've got loads of videos showing what I do, how I get out and how I have managed to actually turn my life around and make it the best I possibly can. So go and check all of those videos out if you want some escapism. Go and watch my Disney videos, they might make you smile. Subscribe for the next one and I'll see you later. Bye.